Tonight, I want to um, I want to go back 2,000 years, if that's okay with you, but try to bring it home to you and give you the feeling that um, that there were real people struggling about real things then, which are very relevant still. I mean, you no. Know, when you think about ancient Rome, what's our image? Hollywood, right? These guys walking around in togas and, and making pronouncements in stentorian tones and uh, asking how the emperor is feeling and all that. Um, I'm going to talk about a period before all those emperors. It's, it's the period known as the Late Republic. It goes roughly from about 133 BC to, I will say, 44 BC, which is when Caesar was um, so roughly, with more emphasis on the latter part of that period, I want to say something about history first, because our images of the past are created largely by history's winners. The voices of the losers are muted, or if they come to us, they're through very carefully tuned filters. And I agree with Catherine Morland. She said, quote, it's rather odd that history should be so dull, since a great deal of it must be invention. <laughs> the struggle to lay claim to the labor, the land, and the wealth of society, which is so much the motive force of history, that struggle is called class struggle. And it carries over into the writing of history itself. The writing of history has long been a privileged calling undertaken within the church, the royal court, the affluent townhouse, the government agency, the university, and the corporate funded foundation. The powers that be not only try to control events, but they try to control our memory and understanding of these events, which is part of controlling the events themselves. The social context in which history is written greatly influences the commodity that's produced and distributed. Edward Gibbon, author of that monumental work, The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, back in the late 18th century, was himself perfectly aware of the class realities behind the writing of history. Can everybody hear me okay? Is anybody having any trouble? Is there no echo or anything? Okay. <clears throat> he talked about how history had to be written by gentlemen. Isn't that interesting? Gentlemen who had the means, the leisure, to pursue such a calling. In his words, wretched would be the work of those whose scholarly efforts, whose daily efforts, are stimulated by daily hunger. Gibbon himself produced what I would call gentleman's history, a genre heavily imbued with an upper-class ideological perspective. Antiquity, all through antiquity, going back to those early times, gives us numerous gentlemen historians with a ruling class or upper class perspective and prejudice. Homer, Herodotus, Thucydides, Polybius, Cicero, Livy, Plutarch, Suetonius, Appian, Josephus, Tacitus, those are the ones I've read, almost all of whom had a rather low opinion of the common people. Maybe Plutarch is an exception. I will partially exempt him. He sometimes is capable of a halfway sensitive comment about him. Gibbon, Gibbon was a member of parliament. He was a firm supporter of the British Empire. He voted against extending, extending liberties to the American colonials. He hated and abhorred, was horrified by the egalitarianism of the French Revolution. Gibbon, this Gibbon had no difficulty conjuring the fairy tale pastoral image of the Roman Empire. We're all where all the vanquished nations blended into one great people. This is a paraphrase of Gibbon, with no desire to regain their independence enjoying the benefits of Rome's rule, directed by both absolute power, virtue, and wisdom. I mean, rarely do we hear about an empire built upon sacked towns, burned crops, shattered armies, enslaved prisoners, mercilessly impoverished and overtaxed populations. 
One eminent 20th century British historian, Cyril Robinson, offers the familiar and fanciful notion of an empire achieved stochastically. Stochasticism is the theory that all things happen by chance, without deliberate intent by the actors above. Without conscious design, I quote Robinson, it was perhaps almost as true of Rome as of Great Britain that she acquired her world domination in a fit of absence of mind. Yeah, right. Again, a fairy tale image. An imperialism without imperialists. Isn't that remarkable? Well, what do you have, a conspiracy theory? You think they actually built this empire? Planned and went out and did things and calculated and raised armies and decided that was a profitable area to conquer? You think they actually thought about that? It was absent-minded. It just kind of got up and said, let's see, who are we going to fight today? What are we going to do today? And that theme, by the way, is very familiar to us. We hear that the United States, for half a century, I have heard the United States was thrusted onto the world arena, reluctantly had to assume the role of world leader to meet the challenges of the 20th century. We're never told who did the thrusting, for whose interests, at what cost to the people at home and abroad, nor why it still remains such an imperative, even without the bugaboo of world communist conspiracy to use as an excuse. Along with his class bias, the gentleman historian is likely to be a male supremacist. Surprised? Anybody surprised here? Gibbon, for instance, Gibbon describes one emperor's wife as, quote, united to a lively imagination a firmness of mind and strength of judgment seldom bestowed on her sex. Usually left unnoticed was the plight of ordinary Roman women who tended to die younger than their male counterparts because of childbirth, exhaustion, mistreatment, and undernourishment. Women who usually lived under the rule of some male, be it the pater familius, the husband, or the guardian, and who were expected to defer to the male while remaining decorous, chaste, and of sweet disposition. Surely this is something familiar about that, isn't there? In recent decades, by the way, there's been an emergence of some feminist scholarship, and the study of Roman women has improved somewhat. Some gentlemen historians let slip a noticeable ethnic bigotry or ethno-class bigotry Cyril Robinson asserts that, quote, the purity of Roman blood began to be contaminated by proletarians of Greek and Oriental origin, persons of feeble character incapable of assimilating the national habits of decency and restraint, although not all Greeks, of course, were vicious or unwholesome characters. <laughs> it's always nice when that when the bigot tries to smuggle in his bigotry under a balanced kind of statement, moderated, qualified, you know. Some of my best friends, right, are feeble and incapable characters. <laughs> the great Theodore Mumsen, you know, who remember Mark Twain's description of that, of, uh, that enthusiastic reception that Mumsen got when Twain was visiting in uh, Germany and whom we might have expected better. Mumsen scornfully describes the Roman Forum, the great open-air assemblage, as a shouting fest for everyone in the shape of a man, Egyptians and Jews, street boys and slaves, freedmen and Greeks. It gets better, or I should say worse. Jerome Carcopino, another eminent classicist, writes that interbreeding between Roman aristocrats and their female slaves or freed women created a hybridization similar to that which has more recently contaminated other slave-owning peoples. It strongly accentuated the national and social decomposition of Rome." Unquote. No segregationist or Nazi blood theorist could have said it better. These are all the reputable historians. The progenitor of all gentlemen historians of the late Republic, the, the fount, the source of all gentlemen history of the late Republic, who himself was a major participant, Cicero, 
who has been worshipped, worshipped by professors and Latin teachers throughout the ages. Cicero railed against the Greeks and Jews who rallied to the side of the democratic leaders. Impoverished individuals, they often throw our assemblies into confusion. The Greeks are given to shameless lying, the Jews to barbaric superstition. You know how they stick together, how influential they are in informal assemblies, unquote. Does any of that have a familiar ring to it? <clears throat> While Republic in form, how democratic was the late Republic in actual social content? At the very bottom of the social order was a large slave population, about one third of the entire population was slaves, many of whom were worked to death in the mines and on the plantations or latifundia as they were called. On the next rung was the great mass of free Romans, the proletariat, many of them ex-slaves or the descendants of slaves who lived at the barest subsistence level in the impoverished towns of Italy. Or they lived crowded into thousands of poorly ventilated, disease-ridden tenements within Rome. Flimsy structures, some of them eight and nine floors high, that frequently burn down or collapse and kill their occupants. No running water, no ventilation, not good. A rung above the propertyless proletarians were the farmers and small landholders around the outskirts of the city and beyond. A step above them was the small middle class of minor officials, merchants, and light industry employers. And now looming above this multitude was a few thousand multi-millionaires, the class known as equites or equestrians because their property historically qualified them to serve in the cavalry, in the elite corps. Although by the late Republic, most of them had probably never even been on a horse. The equestrians were state contractors, bankers, traders, tax collectors, and landowners. At the very apex of the social pyramid were the wealthy landed aristocrats who populated the Roman Senate, who also invested in business and speculation and banking along with the equestrians, but who had vast lands and who lived in obscene luxury and ostentation. The difference between the uh, equestrians and the aristocracy was really more one of lineage than of wealth. <clears throat> they were absentee owners of vast latifundia, which were worked by huge slave populations, and they did little, very little for the land except work it with slave labor and exploit it, squeeze it for profits. They themselves lived on vast estates. Even Cicero, who was not maybe the very richest among them, owned more than eight villas, along with numerous inner city tenements. By the way, very few present day historians of ancient Rome mentioned the fact that Cicero was a slum lord who bragged about how profitable his tenements were. They were profitable, one of the ways they were profitable, the rents were so high, the proletariat couldn't afford those rents, they would have to double and triple up, so there was massive overcrowding in these places to be able to scare up enough money to pay the rents. The aristocracy grew still richer by usurping the Ega Publicus. This was an event that took place, a process that took place, say, in the third century BC, right up to the second century BC. In this process, they took the, there was these vast, fertile, state-owned lands outside of Rome that for centuries before, for generations, had been farmed by farming collectives, small farming collectives of independent free labor farmers, and they fed the entire city of Rome. And during times of war, when the small farmers were away in the army and the farms couldn't be kept up, the aristocrats bought them up at bargain prices, or they used, increasingly what started happening toward the second century, they would use hired thugs to go in and drive the families off the public land and replace them with slave labor. And that process was pretty much completed by the second century, let's say by 199 BC or something. <clears throat> or maybe a little later. <laughs> this process of agrarian displacement, by the way, continues to this day in many parts of the world, including the United States itself. It reinforces the thesis that I've presented in Dirty Truths, which is that wealth creates poverty. We always don't think of it that way. They think of it as a distribution problem, but in fact it's an interrelational, it's a dynamic here. Yeah.
Rome was a republic more in form than content. By the way, nor was the form all that democratic. Almost all major political decisions were taken by the Senate, an aristocratic, non-elective oligarchy, numbering about 600, all men of wealth. The Senate determined foreign policy, appointed provincial governors, and controlled the purse strings of the Republic. The Senate controlled the deployment of army units and the appointment of top military commanders. <clears throat> The Senate was elected by nobody. It was an oligarchy, self-appointed, self-selecting. Along with the Senate, there were two and then three assemblies organized on the basis of tribal associations and property qualifications. In these assemblies, many more voting units were allocated to the rich. In the, in the, in the tribal assembly, the proletariat got one, one unit of vote, and the very rich got something like 14 or something, or 20. And so the rich prevailed on most issues. Those attending the assemblies could vote only on proposals submitted by one of the higher magistrates with only a yea or nay and without the right to amend any clause. It's called fast track. <clears throat> they could select candidates only from a list drawn up by public officials, usually Senate appointed, and assembly debate was limited to those who were invited to speak by the summoning magistrate. Robinson finds nothing wrong with this arrangement. He writes, quote, those who bore the chief burden of fighting and financing the city's wars should also possess the chief voice in directing the city's course. Well, in fact, the very rich did not bear the chief burden of fighting. That dangerous task fell mostly on the shoulders of the common yeoman. In fact, the rich senators did not carry much, if any, of the financial burden. They paid no taxes. They lent money to the state that was paid back to them with interest from funds the state raised by taxing others at home and abroad. So you had this combination of deficit spending and regressive taxes that amounted to an upward redistribution of income. Does that sound familiar? To run for election, one had to be either wealthy or have the support of wealthy backers. The buying of votes was widespread. Rarely did candidates represent discernible principles or programs. So dis to distinguish themselves from each other, they emphasized their personal qualities, their integrity and leadership, the prestige of their family name, their association with important personalities of the day, their past public service, and their heroic war records. Does any of that sound familiar? The only thing missing was television, I would say. Within the Senate itself, control was concentrated in an inner struggle of 20 or so aristocratic families, both of patrician and plebeian origin. The thing we always heard about the patricians versus the plebeians was over, at least by two centuries. That was, rich plebeians were now in the Senate and they were part of the aristocracy. So if you had enough money after a while, after enough generations, uh, you move in. Although, of course, there were still genealogies and people were perfectly aware who was in the patriciate and who wasn't. Uh, but many of the, many of the people, uh, many of the richest senators were plebeians and reactionary and arch conservatives. <clears throat> the elite, this elite group in the Senate, the Senate, uh, it was it, 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 it by the, um, the middle of the second century, by the time of Tiberius Gracchus, who I'm going to talk about later, it divided into two groups, the larger one being the optimates, literally they were the, the best men, as they modestly called themselves. They were the conservatives devoted to expanding the political economic privileges of the rich and the well-born. The smaller faction in the Senate of this elite group were called populares, and they were reformers with democratic tendencies who sometimes sided with the common people against the Senate itself. The popular assemblies were not entirely without influence. On exceptional occasions, with enough unity and mass mobilization, they could pass measures contrary to the dominant faction in the Senate. But that was not often the case. Modern day historians are perfectly aware, by the way, that the Senate enjoyed a near monopoly of power, undemocratic power, and yet they're filled with praise for these oligarchs, describing them, I'll give you a composite of quotes here, bred to a strong tradition of cautious sanity and self-restraint, stout-hearted, 
level-headed and patriotic. Historians look very kindly on this republic for the few. For them, senatorial plutocracy is more acceptable and less threatening than proletarian egalitarianism. They embrace Cicero, a self-enriching slaveholder, slumlord, ruling class, mouthpiece, executioner, and senatorial oligarch. They embraced Cicero as a champion of liberty who opposed Julius Caesar and who refused to live under a tyranny. And when I say they, I mean really about 95% of all present day historians of ancient Rome are Cicero supporters. Only a handful, Arthur Kaplan, uh, G.M. de Saint Croix, me, if I qualify as a historian, a few others, only a handful are sympathetic to the Populares and the Democrats. What does that say about our educational systems in our universities? Cicero, that great champion of Republican liberty, deplored such things as the secret ballot. He said the secret ballot makes it easier for the common people to act independently and do mischief. A year after Caesar was murdered in 44 BC, Cicero, who was, by the way, not among the assassins, but fully applauded the deed, fully supported it, he wrote to Brutus and to other associates, calling for a ruthless bloodletting, a final solution against the Democrats. I do not admit any doctrine of mercy. There should be a salutary severity, for if we are going to be merciful, civil wars will never cease. We need extreme measures, unquote. One is reminded of Cicero's own role as consul 20 years earlier in 63, 63 BC, when he whipped up an anti-subversion witch hunting campaign against reformers in the Senate and then ordered without trial the summary execution of five people he charged with conspiracy against the state. It's called the Catiline Conspiracy. On the basis, by the way, of very dubious and trumped up evidence. Few modern day historians pass severe judgment on this atrocity. H. H. Scullard, a leading classicist, sets the tone by allowing that Cicero may have been, quote, over hasty, but he had good reason to feel he had done his duty. Indeed, he had saved his country, unquote. Behind this willingness, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to repress popular forces is a chronic fear of the democratic excesses of the people. I'm not talking about Cicero, I'm talking about Scullard and his associates. Um, we can understand Cicero, he's an aristocrat and all that. But there's that same fear of democratic excesses. There is fear of the people mobilizing and agitating. They need to be curbed by upper class men of moderation and probity. Upper class moderation and probity are ingredients, I would suggest, that exist more in the minds of gentlemen historians than in actual history. Nothing said about who curbs those at the top, who, those who actually have the actual power and are continually abusing it. <clears throat> the best known and probably the greatest popularis leader was Julius Caesar. Although thanks to the way history is retailed, a few of us know of him in this role. Here are some of the things Caesar did in his six or seven consulships and then later on after the Civil War. Once in power as consul, he founded new settlements for veterans of his army and for 80,000 of Rome's proletarians. He distributed some of the best lands near Rome and elsewhere to 20,000 poor families that had three or more children. Caesar sent many unemployed proletarians to repair ancient cities in the colonies, or he slated them for employment on public works within Rome. He directed large landholders to have at least one third of their laborers to be freedmen, freemen, rather than slaves. So, they ha so every, every latifundio owner had to have one third of his workforce had to be free labor rather than slave labor. And this was a rule that would compel payment of wages and thereby, thereby somewhat diminish the landowner's high accumulation rate, and it would also reduce unemployment and crime. In an attempt to secure affordable housing for poor tenants, Caesar remitted a whole year of rent for low to moderate dwellings. Following Gaius Gracchus and other popularities, Caesar instituted, uh, I'm sorry, Caesar increased duties on luxury imports. <clears throat> 
First, that was to encourage Italian domestic industry, and second, uh, to make the rich pay something for the for the uh, pay something to the state for the obscenely lavish lifestyles they were enjoying. Caesar attempted to impose honest administration in the provinces, where subject peoples were prey to rapacious governors and visiting senators. He saved some of the provincials from the pitiless tax collectors. He capped, he capped the tax rates, he fixed the tax rates, and he eliminated the self-enriching middlemen. He ejected from the Senate all those associated with, with provincial plunder. He eased the desperate burden of a vast debtor class by allowing repayment of debts at lower pre-war prices. He abolished the fines that were put on debtors when they couldn't meet their payments. He ordered that all the interest people had already paid was to be applied to reducing the principal they owed. Oh, if only we, we could get banks to do that today. He canceled all debt interest that had accumulated over several years. This last measure alone, Suetonius estimates, erased one quarter of all debts, a serious loss for rich creditors. By the way, there were two theories as to why people fall into debt. One of them is that many are deprived of adequate income and are subjected to heartless taxes. And so unable to earn enough or keep enough of what they earn, they're forced to borrow on their future labor. As their debt obligations accumulate and more of their income goes into interest payments, they have even less for their own needs and they're forced to borrow still more. Caught in this deepening cycle, they're forced to sell their small holdings and sometimes even themselves or their children into servitude. By the way, he abolished that. Individuals could no longer sell themselves into servitude if they were in debt. Uh, 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 human natural right and sovereignty uh, could not be treated uh, commensurate with property. <clears throat> such was the plight of many, by the way, in the late Republic, and such has been the case throughout history. Today we witness whole nations caught in a deepening cycle of debt, selling off the land and labor of future generations to international investors at very un unfavorable terms to the debtor nations. There's a second theory. The second theory tells us that people in, go into debt because they're irresponsible spendthrifts who try to live off thrifty creditors. In that scenario, the role of, credit, of victim and victimizer are reversed. The creditor is seen as the victim and the debtor is seen as the victimizer. The only thing wrong with that model, by the way, I think it does explain some forms of debt. The only thing wrong with it is that it's applied to the wrong social group, the poor. In fact, there are usually some profligate few who come from socially esteemed backgrounds and who live in a grand style, who cultivate that magic art of borrowing forever and ever and paying back never and never, as it's called. Uh, such limitless credit, though, is more likely to be extended not to the poor farmer or laborer. It's going to be extended to those of gilded heritage. Caesar's efforts at easing the debt burden was designed to help not the profligate few, but the laboring masses. <clears throat> Cicero, for whom such reforms were tantamount to subversion and revolution, voices the fears of many of his class. Quote, I foresee a bloodbath an onslaught of, on private property, the return of exiles and cancellation of debts. Caesar believed, I'm sorry, Cicero believed that Caesar would show no mercy in killing off the nobility and plundering the well-to-do, unquote. In fact, Caesar showed remarkable clemency toward his enemies after the Civil War. In some instances, he spared the lives of those who then participated later on in the plot against his life. A number of historians argue that Caesar's intent was to retain, was to attain and retain autocratic power. And so we even have that term Caesarism. It's not used that often now, very much in vogue in the 19th century to mean autocracy. <clears throat> well, actually, while he accumulated power, we should also look at how he used it. Toward what ends? Cui bono? Who benefited? I just gave you plenty of examples. <clears throat> 
Caesar himself said, quote, I am sated with power and glory. The important thing is to get things done. And he also was concerned about avoiding another civil war. I don't know what Caesar would have done had he lived, but I can give you some indications. His treatment of Athens suggested that he might have eventually taken steps to democratize the Roman constitution. After the civil war, he pardoned the Athenians for siding with Pompey, and he introduced a democratic constitution for that city. Athens had not had a democratic constitution because it had been under Roman suzerainty. hadn't had a democratic constitution in a century more, I think. <clears throat> and b by the way, that's probably why Athens sided with Pompey. It was run by aristocrats who themselves saw a common class interest with the forces that were backing Pompey, which was the Senate oligarchy. Caesar attempted to strengthen democratic forces by enfranchising the population in the parts of Gaul that he had conquered. Certainly an enlightened move. Early in his career, he helped undo Sulla's reactionary legislation. Sulla was this um, military commander in 80, 82 to 80 BC who came in, um, took over, and, and, murdered, uh, and murdered about 1,600 equestrians, about 50 senators, uh, thousands of other Democrats, people who had been sympathetic to the Democratic cause and, and did everything to instill the Senate oligarchy. He was the Pinochet of uh, the late Republic. Um, he abolished the popular assemblies. He, he, he was actually brought, he actually brought the Roman Constitution. If he didn't abolish them, he really practically strangulated them. He brought the Roman Constitution back at least two centuries. <clears throat> and Caesar came in and he, and, and he undid, and he undid um, uh, 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 all the various reactionary legislation that Sulla had put in, stripping the people's tribunes of their ancient authority and the like. Caesar began to regularly bypass the Senate and deal only with the assembly. That's moving in a democratic direction. <clears throat> but that, by the way, is what elitist historians from Cicero to this day have seen as his autocracy, his violation of constitutional procedures. Caesar granted citizenship to all medical practitioners and professors of liberal arts to encourage them to stay in Rome. He set about to provide Rome with the finest possible public libraries. He guaranteed to Jews the right to practice their religion. And he probably was one of the very first leaders of antiquity to, to, get, to extend a, a, a guarantee to religious freedom. <clears throat> and these two were actions that suggest something other than uh, the undemocratic tyrant. One of Caesar's first acts upon becoming consul was to have the proceedings of the Senate and the Assembly published and posted every day. So this make them more accountable to the general public, also to embarrass the senators if he could. During his first consulship, he regularly disregarded senatorial vetoes. He updated and streamlined the voter registration rolls. After the Civil War, he arranged that half the magistrates be popularly elected and half appointed by himself, thereby completely bypassing the Senate. He decisively terminated Cicero's political witch hunts against the Democrats, driving Cicero into exile and rousing panic within reactionary ranks. As part of his war against the Optimates, he substantially expanded Senate, Senate membership, filling its ranks with equestrians, with nobility from Gaul, and if that wasn't enough, he even made senators of a small number of Libertini. The Libertini were the sons of liberated slaves who had risen to distinction on their own merit. All these appointees, by the way, it goes without saying, were totally snubbed and scorned by the Senate oligarchs and optimates. So it's no surprise that Caesar was supported by the Roman proletariat and accepted by many prosperous upper middle class people and entrepreneurs who were satisfied with his orderly administration. Some of the Democrats in Rome saw a total social revolution, a redistribution of wealth among the poor. Some even thought to free the slaves and extend citizenship to foreign residents. Caesar found their support useful, but he was a reformer, not a social revolutionary. He abolished all workers' guilds 
that it, a lot of new guilds were being formed, new worker unions and such. He abolished them, except for the very ancient ones. And he would not go all the way with the Democrats by eliminating all debt payments. And he did accrue extraordinary honors and power to himself. He had himself appointed Imperator of Rome. Imperator has been translated by too many historians to mean dictator. Both Imperator and the other Latin word Dictator, which is spelled ex identically like the English word dictator. Imperator and Dictator were akin to commander-in-chief or supreme commander. They usually were appointed for limited six-month terms, although it's doubtful that he would have stayed only six months. Plutarch reports that Caesar's predominance caused the Senate and nobility to fear that, quote, he might now urge the people to every kind of insolence, unquote. And the worst insolence was for the people to demand a larger portion of the pie. Caesar was assassinated as he presided over the Senate in March 15, 44 BC, the Ides of March as it was called on the Roman calendar, by a dozen or so senators. He actually knew about, uh, there were all sorts of assassination plots against him, and he never acted against the conspirators, he just let them know that he knew about it, and they would shrink back when the light went on. And the story goes, as told by Suetonius, Appian, Plutarch, they're all vivid descriptions of this. He was walking into the Senate, and he had, he had, um, uh, he had dismissed his Spanish guard. He had a, a Spanish bodyguard of, uh, of crack warriors who could have taken out the whole Senate, let alone a dozen assassins. But uh, he had dismissed them and he went in unarmed. As he walked in, someone handed him a piece of paper saying, beware that there's an attack imminent uh, about to happen, the story goes. And he just put that into a pile of sheets of paper that he had. And when he went in, the very first senator who came up to him with a bill proposal, then hit him with a dagger, and the others came around him and got him. And he, uh, there's a description of how he gathered up his toga, uh, bunching it up like this, uh, leaving his legs bare, probably as a protective gesture on his chest, and tried to fight them off, and then fell, uh, ironically, right at the base of the statue of Pompey, which the Senate oligarch insisted on having. Um, there's, there, since then, there's been speculation for 2,000 years as to why Caesar dismissed the Spanish god and went in like this. Appian concludes that he just wanted to die. And he just was getting old. He, he just wanted to die. Uh, I don't think so at all. Uh, that, that's not it. I think, I think he didn't think that would happen right there in the Senate. And I think he um, did not want to show his, a fear by having a guard around him right in the middle of the Senate. <clears throat> Historians who are willing to consider any interest except class interest explain away the assassins in terms, the assassination in terms that are oddly, uh, kind of uh, unsettlingly uh, favorable to the assassins. So we're told that the conspirators had a strong distaste for dictatorship and refused to accept one man rule that they wanted to preserve their beloved republic and its long-standing traditions. Many, like Cicero, supposedly had a profound respect for the law and could not forgive Caesar's usurpation. Cicero was, did not, was not invited to join with the dagger. They, they, uh, you really had these super aristocratic elites, Brutus and Cassius were the, the two main perpetrators. But I mean, they were like mine, like Cicero. Others supposedly felt a personal jealousy and rivalry because they were so overshadowed by this truly remarkable man. And by the way, Caesar was a man of outstanding qualities. He was said to have been uh, a commanding and inspiring figure, uncommonly intelligent, handsome, and utterly charming when he cared to be. He was abstemious in his alcohol consumption, didn't touch alcohol that much unlike other members of his class, and unlike most of them, he was not given to sumptuary indulgences, although there was something of the dandy in his personal attire. He was the son of one of Rome's leading aristocratic families. He was a brilliant and uh, fearless military leader who really inspired his troops. He was highly regarded for the quality and clarity of his writing and was considered one of the great prose stylists of his day. His intellectual interests encompassed a wide range of subjects. He was considered one of Rome's greatest public speakers. He could stir his audience with the force 
and persuasive clarity of his words and he usually avoided the the flowery oratory, you know, the purple style, purple passage style, that was the uh, style of the day. Even a great orator and bitter rival like Cicero was forced to admit that he knew of no more impressive speaker than Julius Caesar. And by the way, this was in an age when public speaking and, and rhetoric was very, very, very important. Uh, uh, public speaking and rhetoric are, are lost arts today in public life in this age of uh, TV sound bites and image engineering. <clears throat> Caesar also possessed some less than perfect traits, most notably like other military commanders of his day, he was a conqueror and plunderer of lands, and he also extorted huge sums from rich kings. I can't get too exercised about that one actually. <laughs> What really, upset, what really upset the Senate oligarchs was not Caesar's accumulation of power, but how he used the power. Like other popularities before him, he attempted to deal with unemployment, he attempted to deal with poverty, he attempted to deal with unfair taxes, he attempted to deal with debt relief, land redistribution, and aristocratic greed. And those were unforgivable things. A ruling class will forgive anything except if you just tiptoe on their interests and smudge the edge of their interests one bit. That's what they don't forget. If the aristocrats long to protect the Constitution, which by the way was an unwritten one of custom and practice, it was not out of some abstract commitment to Republican principles. It was because the Constitution fortified their oligarchy. It was their law, their Constitution, it was their Republic and it was made to accommodate their, quote, traditional class interests. Aristocratic freedom is not meant to serve a popular ruler or a democratic constitution. It's meant to serve no ruler except the aristocrats themselves. And when they were talking about freedom, they were talking about their freedom to do what they want unaccountably to any other social groups. Aristocratic freedom is the freedom to maintain one's own enormous class privileges, to enjoy every prerogative of power and wealth without restraint. It was, and it still is to this day, antithetical to popular democracy. Aristocratic freedom continues to be pursued today by corporate elites with their MAI, GATT, and NAFTA, the arist aristocracy of international global finance, to devise means of making, giving them power that is unaccountable to popular sovereignty. Julius Caesar was the last of a long line of populares. I want to talk about some of the others a little bit, not too much. Is this too dense, too much of you? You following me okay? Okay. Not too many are. Now you're all awake, you all look away. Okay, good. One of the first uh, was Tiberius Gracchus. in 133 BC. He was the one who put that great land reform program to give the land back to the small farmers. He, he was assassinated. He was followed by his younger brother, the brilliant, really the brilliant leader, Gaius Gracchus. And then there were some 10 or 12 others down the line, ending with Caesar and a few others after Caesar, uh, less notable. And almost all of them were murdered. Both the Gracchi brothers were murdered, along with thousands of their followers by the aristocratic death squads. Other leaders met sudden and untimely deaths, sometimes under sus suspicious circumstances. We're talking about here almost a century period, 133 to 44. Remember, the numbers go backwards now. We're in BC, in case you were getting to What all these leaders had in common was that they challenged the rigged oligarchic system. Even if they broke no laws, they were branded by the nobles and by the gentlemen historians of that day and today as provocateurs, is a sort of, who gave a front to sacred custom by unlawfully encroaching on the Senate's domain. Ill-judged and short-sighted transgressors. This composite quote from various writers. <clears throat> According to some historians, these of popular leaders had to share the blame for their own deaths because they acted in such, a, in such a rash and provocative way, especially the Gracchi. And this business of blaming the reformers 
for the homicidal violence that's delivered on them by conservative forces is a time-honored practice. I'm reminded of how a modern-day popular leader, President Salvador Allende in Chile in 1973, in the early 70s, attempted a egalitarian reform in the face of an entrenched military and corporate power, only to be murdered along with thousands of his supporters, and shortly after the military coup, Pinochet's coup, the New York Times editorialized, quote, a heavy share, get that, a heavy share of the blame for the disaster must be assigned to the unfortunate Dr. Allende himself. A blame for the disaster of all these killings and the, dis and, and the murder also of Chilean democracy. A heavy share must go to the unfortunate Dr. Allende himself for pushing a program of socialist reform for which he had no mandate, unquote. In fact, Allende had a sizable plurality. He had won two major national elections and he had a growing mandate. That's why they had the coup. He was, his, his, his percentage of votes in the second election was even higher. I mean, for his popular front. But assuming he didn't have a mandate, does that become grounds for giving him a heavy share of the blame for his own murder? The last to be blamed by the New York Times and most of the US press, the last to be blamed for the mass killings were the killers themselves, the Chilean military, financed, trained, advised, by the U.S. national security state. For the many historians, getting back to Rome, in whom the ghost of Cicero lives and breathes, the senatorial oligarchs of ancient Rome are not to be blamed at all for the massacres and assassinations they perpetrated. Listen to Scullard's uh, polemical gymnastics. Quote, the prudent senators were forced to confront the overzealous reformer. He's talking about Tiberius Gracchus in 133. The urban mob that thronged the assembly in Rome was becoming increasingly irresponsible. There's a whole vocabulary here that they can roll out, you know. Tiberius was threatening to turn the tribunes into agents of the popular will. Imagine that. <laughs> This would have given the assembly greater responsibility than it could properly wield, unquote. So of course they had to kill him. By the way, like every ruling oligarchy in history, the Roman Senate had a long tradition of violating its own traditions and its own constitution when, when necessity dictated, when class interest dictated. And this brings us to Parenti's second iron rule of politics. Don't ask me what the first is. I just like to call it the second iron rule of politics, which I first, in the, in the first edition of Democracy to the Few back in 1974, I enunciated this rule, and it goes like this. When change threatens to rule, then the rules are changed. And faced with challenges from democratic forces, the oligarchs repeatedly invoked martial law, repeatedly suspended their own constitution, suspended all rights, appointed a dictator, and an Appian phrase, quote, found salvation in absolute power. All the emperors who came after Caesar wielded substantially more power than he, and yet the senators went along with them. What about that? They're then followed, you know, with, starting with, with Caesar's grandnephew, uh, uh, Octavius, later called Augustus, and then called Caesar Augustus, the first emperor, really, and a whole series, centuries of emperors after this, the Senate never complained about their power. They wielded absolute power, like way beyond anything Caesar had. But the senators went along with them because the emperors destroyed whatever power the popular assemblies once had. They initiated regressive taxes and attempted no economic redistribution on behalf of the masses. The Senate, too, was reduced in power. It was reduced to a kind of house of lords, you know, a lot of prestige but very little power where, where these guys go in and dawdle and sit around and debate. But the important thing was that during the empire, the aristocrats grew still wealthier. In short, when their class interests were at stake, the senators, like elites today, had no trouble choosing political dictatorship over the palest traces of economic democracy. No more than did the Chilean elites in Chile have any trouble siding with Pinochet.
even if it meant an end to their own oligarchic rule. When push came to shove, their vast holdings meant more to them than their, quote, Republican principles. Their fortunes meant more to them than even their power, as long as they knew that state power was in the hands of someone who was protecting their fortunes. The description Aurelius Victor gives several centuries after Caesar still remained pertinent. I'll quote him, the senators gloried in idleness and at the same time trembled for their wealth, the use and increase of which they accounted greater than eternal life itself. <clears throat> Throughout history, popular leaders, people who have used power to effect some kind of redistribution institutionally, politically, constitutionally, and economically, leaders who have done that throughout history, they have been branded as demagogues and adventurers, motivated primarily by personal ambition. They not, it's not that they wanted the power to end hunger, it is that they just hungered for power. This is the image we get. And this accusation is still leveled today against communists and other revolutionaries and reformers even by some illustrious people who inhabit the left. Interestingly enough, gentlemen historians seldom raise any question about power hunger in regard to the oligarchic elites, as I already said before, those who actually have state power. What was it these popularities were doing? Listen to what Tiberius Gracchus says in 133, describing the plight of landless commoners, many of whom were army veterans. Quote, Hearthless and homeless, they must take their wives and families and tramp the roads like beggars. They fight and fall to serve no other end but to multiply the possessions and comforts of the rich. When the Gracchi brothers and other popularities, I mean, what were the Gracchi brothers and other popularities? Were they self-promoting adventurers? Or did they use power as a means of advancing mass well-being? My view is that popular leaders, it's not, a, it's not an either or formulation, it's a little more complex than that. Popular leaders um, want the opportunity, A, to pursue policies that benefit the common people, as well as B, win mass support and gain some power because it's needed to challenge the ruling class power and get their policies into operation. And at the same time, C, they might enjoy the personal gratification and glory that accompanies such a risky but popular undertaking. Few leaders are either entirely impervious to popularity or motivated exclusively by its pursuit. Likewise, likewise, no leader can afford to be indifferent to considerations of power and hope to survive as a leader. I mean, all the, of course, they all have to worry about their power base. They gotta be concerned about developing a power base. Um, and that, that, that concern and that genius to develop a power base among powerless people does not automatically make a popular leader a demagogue. Especially when these leaders are moving against tremendous odds against the existing power structure. Rather than speculating about a leader's motives and personality, I think it's better to inquire into his actual course of action. We need to ask what social forces thrusted these populares to the fore. In Rome, one such social force was the much maligned proletariat. If we're to believe present-day bourgeois historians, the proletariat played absolutely no creative role in, 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 uh, in developing democracy in ancient Rome. In fact, in fact, the proletariat exercised a long-standing antagonism toward the nobility. Their support helped to bring these leaders forward. In 82 BC, they actually resisted, they actively resisted the reactionary dictator Sulla's army entering the city. And there's a description of, of just thousands of these, of these Romans throwing rocks and throwing things down, every, everything they get their hands on, setting up such a barrage that Sulla's soldiers stopped, they stopped, they stopped the Roman legions from coming into Rome. First of all, it was a, it was a historic crime, that is, 
The rule had been for centuries that no regular Roman army troops, not whole legions, can come into Rome proper. And Sulla was bringing them in to, in fact, carry out the massacre. And those people knew it, and they knew him as the enemy. In 50 BC, they gave enthusiastic support to Caesar when he crossed the Rubicon with his legions and returned to Rome from Gaul with his legions. You see, the senators wanted him back. The same senators who had been contriving and plotting with his enemies. There's some German kings and tribal people that, that, that Caesar was fighting in Gaul. The, Gaul. the Gauls actually sided with the Romans as the lesser of two evils against the Germans coming down. And, um, and Caesar got evidence of the fact that, uh, by testimony of one of the kings, that there are people in Rome, your enemies in Rome would love me if I could kill you. And they, they had a, a confabulation. So they were already committing treason. They were taking a Roman military commander and trying to get him set up for, for getting killed. And then they invite him back and tell him he has to leave his army there. Right. That's the last thing he was going to do at that point. So he came back with the army. And when he crossed the Rubicon, which is that northern river right into Italy proper, that's the phrase we have in our language. Crossing the Rubicon, meaning, you know, really throwing down the gauntlet or whatever, something like that. In 48, the proletariat engaged in mass ag agitation when oligarchic magistrates tried to obstruct the implementation of Caesar's debt relief law. After the civil war between Pompey and Caesar, the city crowds pulled down and smashed the statues of Pompey and Sulla. <clears throat> now this is three decades after Sulla. This is 30 years after Sulla has, almost 40 years after Sulla has gone off to the worms and they still remember these people had a historical memory and hated him. Plutarch offers a glimpse. You see, I'm, I'm taking these little scraps because this one-sided record of history, we have very little, we hear very little from down there and so, but these are indications of what actually was happening here. Plutarch, and most of the, most historians have ignored these, these passages in Plutarch. Plutarch offers a glimpse into the mass support that propelled the Gracchi brothers. When Tiberius Gracchus proposed his agrarian reform, Plutarch writes, it was above all the people themselves who did most to arouse Tiberius's energy and ambitions by inscribing slogans and appeals on porticos, monuments, and the walls of houses, calling upon him to recover the public land for the poor. Unquote. And when Gaius Gracchus put forth his reform legislation, which was much more comprehensive and brilliant, Plutarch writes, quote, a great multitude began to gather in Rome from all parts of Italy to support him. I mean, this is a day before there were decent roads, before telephone, before communication, and word got out. All parts of Italy, people came in looking for a better deal, looking to gain and also to give their support to democratic reforms. After the Gracchi were assassinated in, third, in 133 and 121 respectively, public acknowledgement of their existence was officially prohibited by the Senate oligarchs. So even then they were seeking to control historical memory. And yet the common people continued to commemorate the Gracchi brothers. Plutarch offers the following vignette. The people were cowed and humiliated by the collapse of the democratic cause, but they soon showed how deeply they missed and longed for the Gracchi. Statues of the brothers were set up in a prominent part of the city. Offerings were placed there throughout the year. Many people worshipped their statues as though they were visiting the shrines of gods." Unquote. This all went on despite police proscriptions. In 44, immediately after Caesar's death, the people agitated for guarantees that his land redistribution plan would not be rolled back. And the agitation was enough to compel Brutus to, to uh, reassure the demonstrators, he gets up to the, and tries to calm the crowd down and, uh, and he, he says, the Senate will not tamper with the land reform program. Very grudgingly, you know, he says, although that land really belongs to other people and all that, we'll let you keep it, don't worry. You know, Brutus, by the way, was the one who was dubbed by Shakespeare in his play, Julius Caesar, the noblest Roman of them all, you know, Act Five, the last scenes of and this there lay the noblest Roman of them all. Well, let me tell you about the noblest Roman of them all. He, he was a key conspirator 
with Cassius and the assassination of a great leader who loved him, by the way. Julius Caesar loved Brutus and his reason. Julius, one of, one of Caesar's many, many, many lovers was Brutus's mother, had been for a while. And there's reason to speculate as to whether there wasn't a closer linkage between them. Uh, um, the noble Brutus, let me tell you something else about him. He was a usurer of the worst sort. He lent money to Cypriots at 48% interest instead of the usual 12%. 12% is usury too, at least by traditional, traditional church doctrine. And then he requested that the Roman military come along and help him and his agents collect the money extracted from the Cypriots when they couldn't pay it back. Yet most historians don't think too ill of Brutus. Another conservative senator I'd like to mention to you is Cato. Now Cato is always praised, he's always described as principal. He was one of the most rigid, the most unyielding, although he could also use bribes in an election to defeat Caesar. He was pumping money in and bribes and saying, well, sometimes it's necessary to do these kind of things. But he always presented as so principled, as so, as so virtuous, you know. In fact, Cato, it's after Cato that the right-wing think tank today, the Cato Institute, is named. Because Cato was supposedly was a defender of Republican liberty and opposed Caesar's tyranny. Now it's very interesting when, and very principled as I say, that keeps coming up again. I guess I have to pick up another historian to describe Cato as principled. I, you know. It's very interesting, you know, when left leaders, when left leaders are determinedly, uncompromisingly dedicated to their class struggle democratic reforms and such, they're called dogmatic, totalitarian, even Stalinist, that's a favorite term that gets thrown around, all the more useful for being conveniently undefined. When uncompromising conservatives like Cato rigidly adhere to their class interests, they're called principled. Some months ago, I remember, I, I, I was reminded of Cato. I was sitting, I'd been working, and I wanted to take a break. And a lot of times when I take a break, I I, um, I relaxed by reading fiction, so, so I picked up the New York Times. And, and, no, it's true. People ask me, why don't you ever read fiction? Don't you read fiction? I gave you that novel, into the novel, you don't read. I can't get into fiction. I said, I, said, I can't get into fiction. I, I, read, I read Dickens, I read Dostoevsky, I read all that when I was like 18. I loved it. I, I can't read that anymore. And then I realized what the real reason is. I read fiction every day. New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, like, come on, read fiction. So I was sitting there, and I think of Cato. You know why I think of Cato? Because there's a story about Congressman Sonny Bono, who, who encountered a tree that stood its ground. And, and the obit is saying he was a stalwart conservative with a solidly conservative approach solidly conservative is that a positive framing or isn't it you know i mean when do we hear of someone being solidly radical or solidly marxist you know historians by the way historians who say that we must to understand an era, we must immerse ourselves into the context of that era completely and see it through the eyes of its participants. Such historians often forget that when you do that uncritically so, you chances are you are seeing it through the eyes of the dominant participants. 90% of the primary sources we have on the late Republic come from Cicero. That's why I'm quoting him so often. Cicero. You see the era through the eyes of its dominant class. And you mustn't judge it, therefore? I mean, how far does that work? Do you, do you do that with Nazism, for instance? You say, well, it was the times, you know, that's the way it was in the 30s. You just got to understand it, you see. And don't judge it in any, from any critical perspective. Well, this rule of contextual immersion never applies, by the way, to other people. I never, I never see these historians, for instance, saying 
Well, there was this riot, but let's understand this riot because these proletarians were were struggling for subsidized bread prices. They were struggling for land reform, public jobs. They were struggling for the putting a cap on rents. That that's why they rioted. Let, let's let's look at them. You know, let's see what it was about this constitution and its liberties that were really horribly hypocritical and deficient. Instead, the common people are really looked down upon again and again. Cicero was part of an already established tradition when he repeatedly described the urban poor as, quote, the city dirt and filth, the ex urbis feces, the scum from out of the city, unruly and inferior, a starving, contemptible rabble. See, he admits they're starving, and it's their fault that they're starving. This is some, something about them, obviously. And whenever the people mobilize, against class injustice. Whenever they go into motion, then they become, in Cicero's mind, that most fearsome and loathsome of all creatures, the mob. And that's a term used by gentlemen historians all the way through. Appian, writing a century after Cicero, describes Caesar as, quote, introducing laws to win the favor of the mob. And the mob he describes as the poor and the hot-headed. In our own day, today, P.A. Brunt refers to the city mob. For Lily Ross Taylor, it's the city rabble. For Cyril Robinson, the stupid Roman mob, a selfish, good-for-nothing, parasitic mob. Don't hold back, Cyril. Uh, <laughs> for Scullard, it's the idle urban mob, as if their idleness were purely of their own choosing. And if they were so idle, who did all the work? It wasn't all slave labor, nor even mostly in the, in the urban areas. Meanwhile, the aristocratic idlers, the real parasites, who live in obscene opulence, earn not a harsh word from the great majority of these writers. John Dickinson charges that, quote, Caesar appealed to the cupidity of those who desired to be supported by the state, the welfare free lotus, you see. Dickinson repeatedly writes about Clodius and his mob. Now Clodius was a, a populist, a popularist ally of Caesar, and he sought to legalize the political ward clubs. He organized neighborhoods and guilds to political action. He was aware of the, of the Senate tufts and, and the rule of the clubs, and so he or actually organized people in bands armed with clubs of their own. He outlawed uh, executions without trial. That was a direct jab at Cicero. Claudius also extended the grain dole. All this is judged by Dickinson as attempts to, quote, tighten the control of the mob over political life. Other historians describe Claudius as a demagogue and an adventurer. He and a large number of his democratic followers were murdered by a ruling class death squad operative. Body into the Senate House, built the funeral pyre, and burned down the whole Senate House and cremated his body. During the early empire, the Roman writer Juvenal spoke scornfully of the mob's preoccupation with bread and circuses. And that phrase has echoed down to us through the centuries, a phrase um, <clears throat> adding to the image of Rome's proletariat as a shiftless, volatile mass addicted to endless hands out, handouts of food and entertainment, free food, free entertainment. Now, elite historians, like all elites, all the elites, are always alert to the corrupting influence that state assistance supposedly inflicts upon the poor. Appian tells us that the corn ration attracted the idly destitute and hot-headed elements of the Italian population to the capital. And he contrasts them to those possessed of property and good sense. 1800 years later, Scullard writes that Clodius's law to change the subsidized distribution of corn into a completely free dole hastened the demoralization of the people. <clears throat> By the way, this image of an idle mob of layabouts sponging off the state is little more than a figment of upper class and upper middle class prejudice, both ancient and modern alike. <clears throat> It's really interesting to see how, how many of those who have written about ancient Rome find it so disreputable 
so dis so disgusting that the humble Romans should have been concerned about having enough food for themselves and their children. Oh, they wanted bread. Can you think of that? Imagine that. But this hardly makes them materialistic or degraded. In any event, only a very limited number in Rome received the regular corn dole, often with the humble entitled to a smaller share than the more distinguished citizens. Furthermore, man cannot live by bread alone, not even at the physiological level. The proletarians needed money for rent, clothing, and other necessities. Most of them had to find work, low paying and irregular as it might be. The bread dole often was a necessary supplement. It was the difference between survival and starvation, but it was never a source of total support that allowed them to idle away their days in comfort and leisure. And this raises another question, who exactly was the mob? It's the same question, by the way, that comes up in the French Revolution. Here again, the mob, the mob, the mob. There were some writers, Stanley Loomis, for instance. I think in 400 page book, I don't think he ever once called them the crowd, the people, the poor, the mob. It was the mob, the mob, the mob. The mob cheered Robespierre. The mob uh, opposed the aristocrats, the mob. Who are they? Well, what we hear is that they were lumpens, drifters, and riffraff. In fact, closer study reveals that in both Rome of 44 BC and in Paris in 1789 AD, the mob were mainly artisans, craftsmen, shopkeepers, day laborers, respectable and hardworking proletarians. In fact, when there was a mass demonstration, you see, you only get hints of that. All the shops were closed and the shopkeepers were summoned. And the circuses, who went to the circuses? It wasn't just the poor. A higher percentage of the equestrians and the rich and the aristocrats went to the circuses. They had their well-reserved uh, first-tier seats where they can get the best look at all the bloodletting. It was they, it wasn't the poor people who created and financed the awful spectacles of the, of the amphitheater. The common people of ancient Rome, like the common people of so many societies, had scant opportunity to leave a a written record of their grievances and aspirations. But what little we know of them suggests that the proletariat could sometimes display a social consciousness that was definitely superior to anything possessed by their would-be superiors. Many of them worked next to slaves and were themselves, and were themselves freedmen or the sons of ex-slaves. And many, most of them were almost as poor as slaves. In 63, during Cicero's witch hunt, several dissenting leaders urged workmen and slaves to take joint action against the oligarchs. Now such appeals wouldn't be made unless there was an understanding that there was some kind of community of interest between proletariats and slaves. In parts of Sicily, the agrarian proletariat joined in common cause with slaves to rebel against big planters on several occasions. I mean major rebellions too. Spartacus. And so we face this largely one-sided recording of what is called history. Cicero, Brutus, and Cato come down to us as the defenders of liberty, when they were something quite the contrary. And Caesar, who did something for the poor and moved against privileged property, comes down to us as an elitist tyrant. And what you got here, of course, is this confusion of procedural democracy and substantive democracy. That those who cloak themselves in the trappings of procedural democracy or procedural republicanism um, were definitely against any kind of class democracy or substantive democracy, economic democracy. And those who fought for economic democracy often, because they face a rigged system, often might violate procedural democracy and are immediately labeled as tyrants, power-hungry people. This was true of Caesar, Robespierre, Lenin, Castro, Huey Long, the Sandinistas. We lived through that ourselves. When are they going to have freedom in their country? Ruling elites in America weren't concerned about freedom. They were as, they were as hypocritical as the Senate oligarchs were about Caesar. They weren't concerned about freedom. They were concerned that the Sandinistas were actually making changes in the social structure and class structure of Nicaragua. So what we must do is learn to read history against the grain and swim against the mainstream and try to keep connected to those who came before us. Certainly not the Ciceros nor the Catos as we're urged and trained to do.
and not even the Gracchi or Caesar or the Popularis leaders, rather the anonymous masses upon whose shoulders they stood, the common people, who struggled against all odds with all the courage and all the fears and all the inconsistencies of ordinary people, who put themselves on the line, whose names we will never know, whose blood and tears we will never see, whose words and cries of pain we will never hear, and yet to whom we are linked in a past that is never dead and never really past, and a future that never arrives but beckons us and keeps us going. And so history never ends, the last page is never written, and the best pages are written not by princes, presidents, prime ministers, popes, or even professors, but by the people. For all their faults and shortcomings, the people are all we have. In fact, we are they. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.